Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. On Tuesday, police shot and killed a man in Fishing Lake First Nation. RCMP from nearby Wadena were called to a home in the Saskatchewan community. According to the RCMP, the caller said a man with a knife was causing a disturbance. In a statement Tuesday, the federal police said two officers arrived at the scene. One of them shot the man who died on the scene. CBC News has identified the victim as 37-year-old Soto man Lucien Silverquill. Moose Jaw Police Service is now conducting an investigation into the incident. This is a tragic incident for everyone involved, including the family of the deceased, the community and our officers. We extend our condolences to the family of the deceased and the community of Fishing Lake First Nation. Where are they? That is the question a Yukon Salmon Monitoring Group is asking. As the number of Chinook salmon crossing into the territory are lower than usual for this time of year, the fish ladder in Whitehorse normally sees a total of 1,200 salmon during their run. This year, with the season almost over, there have only been about 300 fish that have gone through. If this is a single event, it isn't going to have an effect overall. But if a warmer weather is the reason, it could have a profound effect on the salmon numbers in the Yukon River. Executive Director of the Yukon Salmon Subcommittee, Elizabeth McDonald, says there could be many reasons for the poor run, but can't know for sure until the fall. Was it because of the record high warm water in the lower river that we'd never seen before? That was through their main part of the migration for them coming up the river. Um, and of course there's always other unknowns that we're not sure about as well. So it, it kind of, unfortunately everyone is like, oh, but what happened? And you got to wait till the fall to kind of figure it out as you piece and take all the information you have, put it together and try to find out what, what happened to them and where they went. A two and a half week long festival is set to kick off in a few weeks in the nation's capital. Included in one of the performances, the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls will take center stage. Here's Annette Francis with that story. With the whoop of a war cry, actor Monique Mojica leads the scene as the other women follow suit. They're rehearsing a few scenes of The Unnatural and Accidental Woman by Marie Clement. It's an emotional play that hits to the heart of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, something Mojica says you need to prepare for. Well, you can't start from that overwhelming sense of grief or rage or powerlessness that we that we all feel that we're all in as an actor you have to really look at the person you have to look at that story you have to look at very specifically what is driving that character but to bend that long neck down till her beak reaches her collarbone where it sits for a long time What's wrong, Mom? What's wrong? Mom? 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 The play is a story Not of the spirits of ten women who bear witness to each other's lives and deaths. Violence. A tough topic, but for actor Jennifer Brusso, okay. it's about giving missing and murdered Indigenous women a voice. I think the work that's to be done is a bit heavy, um, and it is, but it's to, to, to start, you know, tearing down those walls and, um, um, to be really honest and raw about our truths um, because the only way to heal through through this and the only way for change to happen is to be um, to be talking through it and to and, and art is such an incredible form um, to to bring these truths to to the to the open and to, to the public the play will mark the first production in the first season of the National Arts Centre's Indigenous Theatre and will kick off at the Mushkomo Indigenous Arts Festival. For Mahika, it's all quite a big deal. So I've been coming here as an independent actor for nearly 20 years, in 17, 18, somewhere around that mark, and it hasn't always been easy to be the only Indigenous performer in a production or to have an Indigenous production come into this institution. 
that is designed for another kind of theater. The artistic director agrees. He says the Mushkomo Festival has a lot to offer. We're going to see some amazing stuff. There's Buffy St. Marie, there's Susan Aglukark uh, with the orchestra. We have uh, theater, we have dance, we have um, on our main stage, we have our first ever production at Indigenous Theatre here in, with our partners at English Theatre, uh, The Unnatural and Accidental Women by Marie Clements. Uh, it's going to be amazing. The festival officially kicks off on September 11th. Annette Francis, APTN National News, Ottawa. Looks good. Well, we'd want to hear what you think. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Find us online at aptnnews.ca and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest Indigenous news. There are tens of thousands of children in the child welfare system in Canada. In Manitoba alone, roughly 11,000 children are involved with child and family services. 90% of them are Indigenous. On September 9th, APTN News will launch a new podcast called The Disappearance of Natasha Lynn Starr. Here's a preview. My name's Natasha, and I grew up in Manitoba's child welfare system. The system created an emotional landmine that was comprised of unfinished hurts that would bleed if they were triggered. How are you supposed to write the next chapter when the prologue is missing? What is one to do when closure is not an option? The Millennium Scoop is not someone else's history. It's not just a short blurb, paragraph, introduction, or a chapter in a history textbook. It's my history. The disappearance of Natasha Lynn Starr. And joining us now for more on her upcoming podcast is Natasha Reimer Okiba. Natasha, thanks for joining us. We just saw a promo there for the upcoming podcast. What can people expect to hear when they listen? Um, thank you for having me. And people expect to hear just my, well, my life experience growing up in the child welfare system from the beginning to the end, to the abrupt end when I turned 18. Um, it kind of dives into what it was like being a kid in care in Manitoba's child welfare system and all that kind of all that chaos that kind of goes around being a kid in care. Was it a difficult decision for you to decide to share your story in this way? Yeah, it, it, was, it was kind of hard. Um, I had kind of kept all that in for so long and but at the end of the day I really found through this process very it being very therapeutic and I was able to kind of heal and try to make and I was able to let go of kind of the past and kind of move, and it has allowed me to kind of move forward with my life and it was just nice to kind of get that off my chest. There's something liber liberating and freeing from sharing your story for me personally. What are you hoping is the takeaway for listeners? Um, the takeaway for, for listeners is when I was growing up in care, I didn't have really anyone who I could really relate to, like who I saw who made it through the system and was able to go on to university, go on to like live their best life and so my takeaway from that is to show viewers who are currently growing up in care, listeners who are growing up in care that they can do it and also my other hope is that listeners who have never experienced a child welfare system are able to kind of understand and maybe be a little more empathetic towards those who've been in and from care. Somebody may know you as a you know you're young but a long time advocate uh, for youth, uh, especially those who have aged out of care. I guess, uh, as you say, you're, you're hoping to touch both those who have been in the system or are in the system and those who are looking for some understanding of it. Yes, exactly. I wanted to show kids in, in and from care that they don't, they're not a, a statistic. They can be whoever they choose to be and they don't need to carry that shame of their story. Like, I was so ashamed of my story for so long and I felt like it was something that I was supposed to be, that I was embarrassed of just to even say out loud. And now it's just me kind of, I'm not embarrassed anymore. This is me, this is my story. And, and that's, a part of, that's a part of my story, but my story doesn't end there. Well, Natasha, I think it's a pretty important podcast and uh, looking forward to hearing it all. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And again, that podcast will debut on September 9th. Time for a quick break and then part two of our interview with Jody Wilson-Raybould. Here's a look at Thursday's weather forecast starting on the east coast, sunny and a high of 28 for Halifax. 
13 in Nain under partly sunny skies. 19 for Happy Valley, Goose Bay. Showers and 22 for Montreal. 23 with rain for Saguenay. 25 and sunny skies for London, Toronto and Peterborough. 16 with rain for Thunder Bay. 15 and showers for Sioux Lookout. 15 under sunny skies in Puckettawagan. 11 and showers for God's Lake. 22 and rain for Winnipeg and Gimli. 20 with the sun out in Brandon. 23 in Regina under sunny skies. 26 for Swift Current. 16 and showers in Uranium City. 18 under the sun for Stony Rapids. Welcome back. Jody Wilson-Raybould is busy campaigning as an independent candidate in her riding of Vancouver Granville. On yesterday's newscast, we aired part one of our sit-down interview with Wilson-Raybould. Today, APTN's Lori Hamlin finishes off talking about the Trans Mountain Pipeline and Wilson-Raybould's upcoming book. You've promised to change the way politics um, um, is done. Maybe explain. Sure, it's, it's part of it, absolutely. Um, I got involved in 2015 because I truly believed that we could do politics differently, change the way we make decisions, ensuring that all 338 members of parliament are contributing towards discussions and debates about, around fundamental public policy issues. Um, I believe doing politics differently means as much as we can, uh, moving away from partisanship in the sense of having these debates in, a, in an adversarial environment um, where um, one person says that their view is better than the other person's. Um, that's not how we work towards creating consensus and long-term solutions. Um, at the same time, I think that um, our party system is good for organization, but it's gotten to the place where um, there is loyalty that is required to be given by members of parliament to their leader or to the prime minister. And I believe it should be the other way around, that the prime minister or the leader of a party is responsible to their individual members of parliament, who in turn are responsible to their constituents. So as an independent member of parliament, um, I think we need more independent thinkers um, whose only boss are their constituents. So the people of Vancouver Granville are my bosses when I go to Ottawa. Your former party believes that the Trans Mountain Pipeline is in the national interest. And, and now that you're not in that party, has your stand changed? Or it, it is a tough question. I saw of it on your blog, so. OK. It's, um, it's, a, it's a difficult question um, for, well, I should say, it is a polarizing issue here. Mm -hmm. There are many people that support the expansion of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, just as there are many people that oppose it. Uh, my views have changed somewhat since the original decision was made in November of 2016. I do not feel that we're in a position, or the government's in a position to, to expand the pipeline, given um, at, this time. at this time the my uncertainty about the economic benefits for it, um, concern about environmental protection along our coasts, concern about how we're going to, in a real way, transition to uh, a clean uh, economy, um, to clean energy. We have 10 years to be able to um, substantially address climate change in a real way, and that's going to take action by everybody. And also in this area, we need to make sure that, in all areas actually across the country, that Indigenous peoples are fundamentally involved in decisions that are being made or development projects or pipelines being built on their traditional territories. So people that hold the proper title to the, the territories are involved in those decisions. Um, it's going to be a controversial issue, but I do not believe that the necessary conditions are in place for the expansion of Trans Mountain. On September 20th, your new book, From Where I Stand, will be launched. Yes. And I, I know you're not allowed to say too much, but can we expect a, a tell-all about the SNC-Lavalin affair, or, or, or is this something more? 
It's not a tell-all on SNC. It's not a memoir uh, for myself. Um, it's a book that I wanted to put out for a long time since after I was regional chief. It's focused on Indigenous reconciliation, what we um, can do, what people have been asking for for decades in terms of how to create the space for new relationship, for rights recognition. It draws from a series of many speeches that I've given over the course of the last decade. And uh, yeah, I look forward to it, it coming out. I think that issues around Indigenous reconciliation are fundamentally important to um, this country. I hope that it is a significant election issue and that we once and for all challenge um, political parties, elected officials, to create the space for transformative change in the country and have Indigenous peoples be able to self-determine for themselves their futures. Everything sounds great. It sounds like you're in a great spot. You've got the book. We're in your new campaign headquarters, uh, the commissioner's report, of course. Are you in a good spot? Um, it looks like it. Yeah. I. I feel content with where I'm at. I feel very comfortable um, going into the next election. We have received overwhelming support from people right across this riding and across the country for that matter. Um, we have uh, an amazing uh, team of volunteers that continues to grow every day. That's out on the door, it's making phone calls, we're fundraising. So I'm really, um, pleased about the support that we're hearing and walking down the street people coming up to me and, and expressing support uh, that way as well so i'm looking forward to the um the coming weeks leading up to to october the 21st and and uh, i hope that uh and i will work as hard as i possibly can to re-earn the the trust and support of the people of vancouver granville well amazing um good luck and thank you so much for having us thank you and if you missed part one of that interview you can watch the entire interview over on our website aptnnews.ca time for another quick break but stick around there's more to come Here's a look at the rest of Thursday's weather forecast, picking back up in sunny northern Alberta. 19 is the high for Fort McMurray and Fort Chippewan. 21 in Medicine Hat, 24 in sunny for Lethbridge. Partly cloudy for Victoria and Vancouver with a high of 24. 21 under sunny skies for Fort Nelson. Sun's out and 20 for Prince George. A high of just three with showers for Rock River, 20 for Beaver Creek and Mayo. 21 in Fort Liard and Trout Lake under sunny skies. Showers in 10 for Norman Wells. Minus one with snow for Saks Harbor. Plus four in Polituck. Showers in six in Chesterfield, a high of 14. And sunny skies for Baker Lake. Zero with a chance of snow in Resolute. 12 in Clyde River. Welcome back. There are new and growing concerns about the prevalence of plastics in the environment. Scientists have found tiny plastic particles in snow in some of the most isolated areas of the world. Researchers examined snow from places including the Arctic, northern Germany and the Swiss Alps. They say they found enormous concentrations of microplastics in those samples. The findings suggest Microplastics are being sucked into the atmosphere and carried long distances. The study's authors are calling for better monitoring of plastic particles in the air. We're getting our first glimpse inside the wreckage of the doomed Franklin expedition, and it is shockingly well preserved in spite of having spent nearly two centuries at the bottom of the sea. Parks Canada has released this video taken earlier this year. The vessel is nearly 90% intact, with the ship's wheel standing perfectly upright. A remotely operated vehicle was used to explore inside the vessel, where you can see shelves lined with dishes and cooking utensils. The Terror and its sister ship, the Erebus, set off from England in 1845 to find the Northwest Passage. There is hope that documents might be recovered that could offer clues as to what happened to the expedition 
and its crew. Boaters on a lake northeast of Vancouver likely did a double take when they saw this. This uh, black bear out for a swim on Sunday, which we'll hopefully see here in a second, a dog uh, pat was dog paddling across the lake. A uh, witness captured the video, which we're not seeing, and posted it on Instagram. And I guess we just don't have it, but uh, they thought it was pretty cute, and there's been a lot of bear news this week. The traditional knowledge of plants and herbs is being passed on to new generations. APTN's Priscilla Wolf talked to three different herbalists who are practicing traditional medicines. Up in northern Saskatchewan, Joseph Victor Misponius is picking plants and herbs to help heal people. I learned it from my late mom and dad. And I started when I was five years old. But we had to do it uh, in secret at that time eh, because the traditions were outlawed. He didn't start openly practicing the craft until the year 2000. My mom used to say, don't ever, don't tell nobody about what we're doing here because we get found out, we'll get, we'll get jailed and your kids will be taken away from us, he said. He's waiting for the first frost to pick sarsaparilla root. With cancer, I use a wild sarsaparilla root, which I pick in the late fall because uh, ants lay their eggs on that, on that root in the summer month. And it's not good to pick then. I usually pick it in the late fall after the first frost hits. The traditional knowledge of the herbs has been passed on for generations, and he's eager to share it. And I've done people with uh, heart problems. This one drink, your, your heart is back to normal. Even uh, failing kidneys. I've done a lot of people with failing kidneys. And for that, I use a uh, uh, Labrador tea. Joella Hogan lives in Mayo, Yukon, and learned about herbs in a different way. My mom was a nurse, a First Nation nurse at the hospital in Whitehorse, and I was part of the initiative to bring traditional First Nations teaching and medicine and food and culture and language into the hospital. She grew up surrounded by traditional mentors and teachers. She studied environmental science and planting in post-secondary school and combined her traditional knowledge to make soaps for healing. All of those plants that I pick go into soap, like rose petals, juniper berries, um, spruce tips. I harvest those, dry them, and then put those into my soaps. There's such an interest in um, Indigenous-made products, plants from the land. So many people are wanting to be to use natural products and things that come from the land. Like, I cannot keep up with the demand. And that's your APTN National News for this Wednesday. For the latest, visit our website, aptnnews.ca, and download the APTN News app. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Tune in tomorrow where we'll have that bear dog paddling viz for you. We'll see you back here then.